Thank you so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, experts sounding an alarm that some American schools are brainwashing young people with propaganda. We've got details. Plus, we'll take a look at why Christians and Hindus are fighting over land and influence in India and why experts are blaming the country's government for the violence. The perpetrators themselves are posting videos of mob attacks on churches. They're showing the churches being burned down. They literally show the police stepping aside to allow the, the mob to attack these Christian churches. Then later. What I learned is that just a mom, an ordinary mom in a community can really make an impact and really impact change in a lot of these issues. They're moms for liberty. A group of women coming together to stand up for parental rights in schools and across the government. We'll take a look at their victories and battles. All these stories and more are coming up next from the CBN Newsroom. This is CBN Newswatch. I want to begin this half hour with experts sounding an alarm on what they're calling Confucius Institutes or Confucius Classrooms, brainwashing American young people with Chinese Communist Party propaganda. This includes more than 500 public school classrooms across 34 states, from high school all the way down to kindergarten. Some are located near U.S. military bases. Adele Hurd is on this more on Top Story. The Chinese government is believed to have spent at least $17 million establishing Confucius classrooms in 142 school districts across the U.S., teaching school children about Beijing's view of the world. Confucius classrooms are the public school version of Confucius Institutes, Chinese government-financed cultural programs that operate on college campuses, like this one at George Mason University. Congress has cracked down on Confucius Institutes by targeting their funding. Experts told the House Committee on Education and the Workforce that Confucius classrooms are operating with little or no oversight. This is a, an issue of national security. When you look at the indoctrination going on in our classrooms from several different perspectives, this is one of the most heinous. What they want to do is influence our children into believing that no, it's a good system, and China is a normal country that is not tyrannical. Confucius classrooms are presented to school districts as cultural exchange programs and the chance to learn the Mandarin language. But they're a project of the Chinese Communist government, and they teach young people the Chinese Communist Party view of politics and history. So they will not talk about sensitive issues such as what happened in Tiananmen Square in 1989. They would not talk about Taiwan. And, or, or when they talk about Taiwan, they will use the official version to say Taiwan is a province of China. You know, it always and always will be. And China is offering schools big money. Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology in Fairfax County, Virginia, has reportedly disclosed that it's received at least a million dollars in donations through the Confucius Classroom Program. Nicole Neely, president of Parents Defending Education, also warns Confucius Classrooms are operating near 20 military bases, influencing the children of American military personnel. To your question about the military bases, we don't know what is happening, and that to me is the most frightening part. Who are these employees? What do they have access to? And what is going back and forth, both going into the minds of our children and then what data is flowing out of these? That's a concern, Neely says, because Confucius classrooms also give the Chinese government access to data about the schools and the students. Dale Hurd, CBN News. The Biden administration is awarding more than $1.4 billion to projects to improve rail railway safety and to boost rail capacity. Most of the funding is coming from the 2021 infrastructure legislation. The Transportation Secretary said in a statement, these projects will make American rail safer, more reliable, and more resilient, delivering tangible benefits to dozens of communities where railroads are located and strengthen supply chains for the entire country. The money will fund 70 projects in 35 states and Washington, D.C. President Biden took action to address the migrant crisis by granting temporary legal status to nearly 500,000 Venezuelans who arrived in the country by July 31st. That will make it easier for them to find work in the U.S. It is a key demand of local and state officials struggling to deal with a growing number of migrants in their cities. The administration is also sending 800 Defense Department personnel to the border as the number of border crossings is surging. 
These migrants are part of an unbroken chain, strengthening all the way, stretching all the way back to South America. The impact of thousands of people making the trek north is taking a huge toll on the communities they pass through. Chuck Holton brings us the story now from the Darien Gap. What was once one of the most remote and pristine jungles on planet Earth is now an environmental disaster. Trash litters the banks of the river locals once depended on for their water. Now the bitter irony is that in a place which gets a dozen feet of rain each year, these indigenous tribes have to import bottled water. So it's about 8 o'clock in the morning on the Rio Turquesa going into the Darien Gap, and we're starting to pass dozens and dozens of these boats coming out completely full of migrants. You see all these migrants here behind me. They're from all over the world, and they're all headed out to the river end where the road is. The problem is there are not enough boats to get them out of here and get them down to the road where they can continue their journey to the United States. Three hours upriver, we come to the last village before reaching the Colombian border. The scene is apocalyptic. Thousands of migrants arrive each day, more than six times the village's original population. There's nowhere to sleep and no adequate facilities for the crush of humanity dragging in after six days in the jungle. People line up to register for the boat ride out, standing for hours under the merciless sun. Although many suffer from heat stroke, the tiny clinic has almost nothing to offer. Yeah, we're here five minutes and there's people passing out left and right. The sun came out, it's super hot. They don't have many resources here to help. This is really what they need. They need resources. These guys, they, they need volunteers. They need supplies. With thousands of people coming in here every day, there's just no way that they can take care of all the people that are coming in with needs because by this time, they've already been walking through the jungle for five or six days. And so they get here, they're all half dead. Some of them are mostly dead. And like this one right here, just dehydrated, passed out in the sun, and they really need time to recover before they continue their journey. And many are dying in the jungle. People who was passing the river, they could just see the dead bodies in front of them. And me and my friends, we just go and we just covered them with some plastics because we didn't want some wild animals to eat them or something. And also there were some children and also some families, they were passing from that path. We didn't want them to see the dead bodies. Hmm. And it was extremely, extremely dangerous way. Now, the tribe has reached a breaking point. They've decided to build a separate camp for the migrants across the river, one that will hold up to 15,000 people. We've decided that it has to be a shelter away from the community, which should give migrants their own place for food and shelter, as this has affected every aspect of our lives, including social, economic, cultural, and even education. Right now, they are defecating in the same streets where they are sleeping. Nobody wants that. We want everything to be well organized and in order, so that the migrants feel better when they come to the community. This year, the number of people traversing the gap en route to the United States has exceeded 350,000, which is already 100,000 more than 2022. And despite the toll in human misery, the numbers just keep rising. From Panama, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Coming up, mobs burning churches, more than 100 killed, women raped and paraded in the streets. Hear the shocking reason behind these attacks against Christians in India. We've got the story when we come back. Stay with us. A fierce battle between Hindus and Christians is raging in a remote region of northeast India. Some human rights experts blame the country's government for fueling the religious violence. As George Thomas reports, what started as a feud over economic benefits now has the state teetering on the brink of a civil war. India's northeastern state of Manipur is making headlines. Manipur means land of jewels. Outside the capital, armed guards protect a kooky village. They're volunteers who are on the lookout for Meite attackers. But the state, affectionately known as the Switzerland of India for its natural beauty and remoteness, looks more like a war zone today. Some argue the Northeast Indian state is in a state of civil war with news of burnings and beheadings. Religious and ethnic clashes between the Hindu-majority Métis community 
and the tribal Christian Kuki minority over land and influence in the state has left at least 180 people dead and over 500 injured. 300 churches have been destroyed. And just imagine that if one, two, five, ten were destroyed, but we're talking about 300 churches destroyed. The European Parliament accuses India's Hindu-led BJP government and its Prime Minister Narendra Modi are fueling the violence by pursuing, quote, politically motivated divisive policies promoting Hindu majoritarianism. Modi, whose party controls Manipur state government, faced a no-confidence motion in parliament last week for his silence on the escalating violence. The underlying issue here is that the central government, the BJP party led by Prime Minister Modi, has not reacted. He's been forced to make one comment, but even that was setting a context for why the violence was happening that ignored the violence against Christians. In Manipur's capital city, Hindu women creating roadblocks like this one to check cars for Christians. In May, a Hindu mob paraded naked two Christian women. One had been reportedly gang raped. Several videos on social media showed mobs also burning down churches. The perpetrators themselves are posting videos of mob attacks on churches. They're showing the churches being burned down. They literally show the police stepping aside to allow the, the mob to attack these Christian churches. As a result, Christians have lost complete trust in the Manipur police. This video showing dozens of Christian women kneeling, crying and begging Indian soldiers to stay in their village fearful of more Hindu attacks. Fighting erupted in early May when the state government extended land, jobs and other benefits typically reserved for the minority Christians to the Hindus. The decision led to some of the worst fighting between the two biggest tribes in the state. Human rights and religious freedom experts accuse Modi's government of pushing a radical ideology that believes India is for Hindus only despite its pluralistic and diverse society. This political movement is essentially saying India is your homeland, but it must also be your holy land. And it's putting a religious uh, umbrella over everything that happens. And it's allowing them to force other minority faiths out. The violence in Manipur has displaced more than 60,000 people internally. And it's not just in Manipur. The New Delhi-based United Christian Forum says there have been more than 400 incidents against Christians in 22 other Indian states in the first six months of this year. India, with 1.4 billion people, is the world's largest democracy. However, Modi's critics argue democracy has been in retreat since he took power in 2014. The State Department called out India in May for its deteriorating religious freedom and its treatment of Christians and Muslims in particular. Government actions, including the passage and enforcement of discriminatory policies, such as hijab bans, anti-conversion laws, and anti-cow slaughter laws, have created a culture of impunity for threats and violence by vigilante groups, especially against Muslims and Christians. Meanwhile, lawmakers on the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee urging the State Department to designate India, among others, as a country of particular concern, which would make New Delhi subject to U.S. sanctions for violating the International Religious Freedom Act. No diplomacy ought to get in the way of calling it for what it is. If a country is, is engaging in serious religious persecution, they need to be designated CPC. George Thomas, CBN News. Still ahead, they are moms and they are on a mission, standing up for parental rights in schools and across the government. We're sitting down with one of the founders of Moms for Liberty, next. Welcome back to CBN News Watch. They call themselves Joyful Warriors. Since 2021, Moms for Liberty has enlisted more than 100,000 members from across the country. The goal, to stand up for parents' rights at each level of government. While the group is winning victories, it's also drawing five fire. CBN's Jenna Browder traveled to Florida to sit down with one of the founders. 
I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. Political statements like that led to a groundswell of reaction across America. Parents seeing their rights under attack, from being denied any say in the classroom to transgender issues and mandating masks and vaccines during the COVID-19 pandemic. These issues led Tina Deskovich, a longtime PTO volunteer, president and school board member, to shift her thinking. But something started to really change. I started to see some of the assignments that were coming home that were concerning. Uh, the state had passed some really extreme uh, standardized testing laws that were impacting districts all around the state. And that kind of brought me to a new level, trying to get involved at the school district level and even um, going to state legislators. And what I learned is that just a mom, an ordinary mom in a community can really make an impact and really impact change in a lot of these issues. And that thinking laid the groundwork for Moms for Liberty. Tina eventually met Tiffany Justice, another concerned mom and former school board member in a neighboring county, through their shared congressman. After I lost my reelection, I did some self-evaluating, like what am I gonna do with all this knowledge that I have and that I've gained over the last four years? What am I gonna do about the things that are important to me in my life, my children, my family, this country, education and how it's failing American students right now. And the idea for Moms for Liberty came to fruition. And uh, in Florida, you need three board members to start a nonprofit. And so uh, Tiffany was right there on the list and I reached out and she was like, yeah, yeah, we need to help uh, American moms around this country. What started here in Florida has now grown to nearly 300 chapters nationwide and well over 100,000 members in 45 states. If you could talk about some of the biggest wins you guys have seen uh, since you formed. I love that question because there's easy things to point to, but it's, sometimes it's harder to point to all of the little wins, which are huge to a mom in a small county somewhere, a small school district who has been fighting tooth and nail to expose the pornography in the classrooms. You know, those are huge wins. To get a, the, the district to draft a policy that parents now have input on library book selection, huge win. Last year, Moms for Liberty endorsed candidates in 500 school board races across the country. 275 of those candidates won. Our growth, obviously, is a huge win. Uh, we've had legislation, I think 14 different bills um, over six or seven different states over just the last year, uh, parental bill of rights that have been passed in several states that our moms have been behind from the day they're filed and they help get them across the House, the Senate, and into governor's hands and signed. And so there's just, the movement has taken on a life of its own. With all of the attention has also come heightened scrutiny. The Southern Poverty Law Center recently named Moms for Liberty an extremist group. They say you guys advance conspiracy theories and spread hateful imagery and rhetoric against the LGBTQ community. What's your reaction to that? We reject every word of that. Uh, they, the title they put on us is an anti-government extremist group. I just finished telling you that we endorsed in 500 school board races and won 275 of them. Tiffany and I served as elected school board members, participated in our government. We are uh, you know, inspiring and teaching our moms all across the country to get involved in the process and the way it was, the way they're supposed to get involved, to do their civic duty, to show up at meetings, to, to comment during public comment, which was created for them to comment, to run for office if they don't like what they're seeing. And, you know, and hopefully win and change the direction of their communities. There's nothing anti-government about that. And they do have a target on their back at their annual summit in Philadelphia this year. The night before, we were supposed to kick off our summit at the American Revolutionary War Museum. Uh, vandals came and, abu and um, they, the vandals arrived the night before. They smashed the windows of the museum. They spray painted and graffiti on uh, the mural of Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, they protested for weeks that we were arriving. And then the night we arrived, uh, you know, streets were cut, shut down around the museum for protesters. Despite that, they call themselves Joyful Warriors. It's a beautiful name, isn't it? Because look throughout history. Warriors, you know, that, that connotates and draws images in your mind of, of people um, that are fighting, that they're in battle. They look, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, you know, strong and courageous if you think of a warrior. But what does a mom look like? What does her face look like when she's out fighting for her children and her children are watching? You're not gonna look necessarily like a hardened, battled warrior of old times or, or even, you know, on the, on the fronts in, in World War II. You're gonna look like someone who is smiling, who is joyful. And speaking of the future, Moms for Liberty has gained the respect of many of the leading 2024 GOP presidential hopefuls, from Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis to Nikki Haley, 
who all spoke at the Philadelphia summit. Looking back, Tina says it's nothing short of a miracle. Moms for Liberty has seen this level of success. And you kind of see God's handprint on getting this off the ground. 100%. I, you know, we get hit piece articles written about us all the time. How can two moms, how can just some moms that don't have a whole lot of uh, experience and education and doing the things that they're doing right now. How do they grow a national movement in two years? How do they grow to 45 states? 300 counties are covered, 300 chapters, 120,000 active members. How did they have five presidential candidates at their summit just in the second year of existence? The truth of the matter is, is God has been with us from the very beginning, and that is it. We started in my back bedroom with $500 and a box of t-shirts. As for what's next for Moms for Liberty, Tina says it's a matter of expanding in their fight for parents' rights. Right now, they're in 300 counties nationwide, on their way to reach all 3,000. In Melbourne, Florida, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Coming up, the story of a baseball superfan captivating crowds at stadiums across the country with his feet. You've got the story. Stay with us. An incredible baseball story from a man born without arms. Tom Willis never let that stop him from pursuing his dreams. I step back, bring this leg up. The baseball fan since boyhood taught himself how to throw a ball with his foot. Now he's thrown out the first pitch at nearly every baseball stadium in America. Willis is set to hurl out one more toss at Angel Stadium in Anaheim hitting all 30 stadiums in Major League Baseball. Beautiful. Time now for your Monday motivation, and today I want to leave you with this word of encouragement. Embrace forgiveness. Unforgiveness is unforgiving in too many ways. It hurts you physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and that cost is simply too high a price to pay. Let it go, let it go, let it go. It is a great day to forgive. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. You can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News channel as well as online, cbnnews.com. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us, newswatch at cbn.com. And, of course, you can reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless.